Rainbow 2A. The rainbow is a marvel of nature, so remarkable that its cause has always been thought. And yet, it is so little understood that I cannot choose a better subject to demonstrate how, by the method I employ, we can arrive at knowledge denied to all who have written before me. How ancient were those writings? How time-honored the ignorance? How recent the new knowledge. And how new the method. How warranted the boast of the new science. And of its spokesman, René Descartes. 2,000 years earlier, there had been presented a rational explanation based on observation and experiment, divorced from legend and myth of this marvel of nature. For 2,000 years, the philosopher's teachings had inspired or challenged all who labored to fathom the mysteries of light to advance the science of optics. After the philosophers of Greece, those of Rome and Alexandria, Seneca and Ptolemy, and then the physician sages of Islam, Avicenna, Al-Hazan and their disciples, and after them the later Aristotelians, the churchmen of medieval Christendom, Bishop Grosstester, Dominican leader Albertus Magnus, Franciscan Roger Bacon, Vitolo, Master Theodoric, Freiburg and others. In the centuries or two that followed, there was little advance beyond the Islamic medieval optical science. The 15th, 16th century writers, Jerome Cardan, Francisco Marolaicus, Giovanni Battista Porta, Antonio de Dominis, whether ignorant, unappreciative, or scornful of the work of their predecessors, place more trust in their own powers of reasoning and in airy speculations than in careful observation. But for confidence in reason and method, his own of course, no one surpassed 17th century master geometer Descartes. And perhaps with some justification. For had he not invigorated optical science by adding his powerful methodical geometrical reasoning to the new knowledge bequeathed by Johannes Kepler and Willy Broad Snell. Yet method, even Descartes, needed occasional prompting by observation and reason, some guidance from experimental test. It is no surprise then to find the oft-repeated observations with transparent globe in a shaft of sunlight described as if anew the concentration to a focus of transmitted light, the colored images, the projection of the telltale colors on the screen or wall, and the brilliant red flashes in the backward projected light. And the same basic inference is drawn. In the globe, one perceives enlarged, 
just what occurs when sunlight is intercepted by minuscule spherical raindrops in the sky. But for Descartes, the challenge is now to explain these phenomena by rigorous calculation, by the pen, confident with his precise knowledge of refraction that he can calculate. The path of the rays which fall on different points of a globe of water to determine at what point, after two refractions and one or two reflections, they will come to the eye. First, for one reflection, Descartes tabulates the results for different incident rays. Then likewise, for two reflections. And then, in a more detailed step-by-step -step calculation, for the critical region of the limiting rays. For Descartes finds that after one reflection and two refractions, there are many more rays which can be seen at an angle between 41 and 42 degrees than at smaller angles, and none can be seen at larger angles. Similarly, for two reflections, there is a minimum rather than the maximum angle of reflection, and the concentration of rays is at 53 degrees. For the master geometer of the 17th century, there is no difficulty in demonstrating clearly and unequivocally how the calculations and observations with a single sphere relate to the appearance of a host of innumerable raindrops in the sky. Every raindrop, illuminated by the parallel rays of sunlight, sends back a hollow cone of light. Here, the illustration is of the inner 42-degree cone, which forms the primary bow. Each raindrop contributes independently, reflecting back the same geometrical pattern of light. From the appropriate part of each reflected cone of light, some rays reach the observer's eyes. And all these rays together, from all the drops, constitute a cone of precisely the same angle, 42 degrees, as the cone of light from each drop. And the axis of this cone is the line parallel to the sun's rays passing through the observer's eye. Change 42 degrees to 53 degrees, and mutatis mutandis is the geometry of the secondary rainbow. What had been observed and conjectured 300 years earlier by Theodoric of Freiburg, what Kamal al-Din part inferred and part demonstrated is now proved decisively. Descartes is assured that reason accords so perfectly with experiment. It cannot be other than I have explained. Yet even Descartes must confess that one principal difficulty remains. Color, the age-old mystery. It is time again to seek a little help from experiment, and again a long familiar one, the generation of rainbow colors by crystal prism. Sunlight falls on the prism and the rays are deviated, but there is little evidence of color. Not until the shaft of light is restricted by a slit. Now near the edges, where the light is bordered by darkness, colors are generated, and these most perceptibly with a narrow slit. Surprisingly, the great geometer does not consider that equivalently and more simply, rather than narrow the slit, for how narrow is narrow anyway, one might increase the distance to the screen in order to brighten the colors. Perhaps a narrow slit seems to deca to conform better to his own particular mechanical theory of color. From spheres, and prisms, and slits, it is hardly a precise logical step to rainbow colors in the sky. Yet Descartes, confident and elated by his achievement, proposes similar explanations of halos and coronas. Finally, he proposes to improve on nature by art, to make spectaculars in the sky by projecting diverse liquids to various heights 
on a scale sufficient to conceal the artifice and overawe the population at large. paint the rainbow in the sky to demonstrate the full triumph of Cartesian philosophy, the simulation, indeed the reproduction of nature by mechanical artifice. Mm -hmm. 